fact that in order for you to think about the other different, as Einstein thinks, you have to allow the fact that all time is exhausted by mutual, mutually existing different time systems. Mutual, because according to Einstein's uh, idea of relativity, the world is a little bit like how Sato imagines, Sato's imagination of how I'm subject, and from that point of view of the subject, I consider the other as <coughs> an object. If the other is object, I'm subject. No, no. If the yeah, if, if the other is a subject, I'm object in relation to it. That's kind of a mutual exhaustiveness uh, that uh, Bergson attacks. In order for you to to think about the world in those exhaustible uh, way, you have to necessarily presuppose subject that is interchangeable with each other. Point, you know, interchangeable in the sense that if, if A is a subject, B is an object. B is subject, A is an object. So, um, um, Bergson says, when we talk about other time, when you allow the fact that other time exists, when you allow the fact that other subject exists, you're not talking about something that is imaginable by Peter. You're not talking about other time. Peter cannot imagine you know, Paul's time as something that is imaginable, something that Peter can empathize with, shall we say, as if Peter is putting himself in the shoes of Paul. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about interchangeable subjects. Other time, as, a, as a regarded by Peter, is possible, in this, in this uh, quotation, impossible only when Peter surrenders his existence as consciousness, he says. That means, when Peter regards Paul as nothing but, I'm sorry, and when, when, if, uh, if Peter regards Paul as nothing but, uh, I'm quoting here, external envelope, external envelope, which points to possible world of Paul, possible world of other time of Paul. Other time for Bergson is uh, something that is livable by no one because of the reason. He talks about the fact that you have a single world, you have a single time, because of the fact that every one of us have to posit the other time, which is ruled <coughs> by nobody. Fourth dimension counts. Fourth point. We have to posit that, that beyond. Inasmuch as Paul is a mere external envelope for that other time. Paul, to, in, in the eyes of Peter, is inadequate sign. Inadequate sign would, would envelopes within oneself possible world that Peter cannot empathize with, but only allow the fact that it exists. So, um, I mean, the uh, this, the same idea rever reverberates in, in Freud's idea of the Leben Mensch neighbor. Um, the, uh, uh, how they do. Another person, other subject, as a as, a, as another object. Um, Leben Mensch uh, captures that strange anonymity uh, that we have to allow in order to the, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, strange an anonymous person that that uh, we have to allow, uh, in, or, in order for us to allow uh, that the fact that unconscious exists. In phenomenology, uh, 
Michael Funke talks about this kind of neutrality as a chiasmic relation, in the sense that neutrality, people cannot meet in their phenomenological relation with each other, but their encounter is always chiasmic. They never meet. Something is always missing. Excess is always there. Okay. Let me turn to Marx. Marx is Peter and Paul. Slightly different. Here, um, <coughs> um, he talks about Peter and Paul when he talks about um, the rise of value form, which is the most important concept for uh, Marx's analysis of capitalism. The rise of form. Um, Everything hangs on this idea of materiality of the idea, idea of form. Form that is a materiality of abstraction, something that's abstracted, and therefore it's material. This kind of paradoxical <coughs> idea of, the, of things of what he's trying to do, capture by the, by the word form. Um, mm, teaches a theolo theological um, the, uh, implications, which I will talk about um, in a minute. Um, so, this idea of form um, captures for Marx uh, how inequality rises in, in capitalist exchange, how inequality is, that is uh, inherent to capitalist exchange. This inequality, in, in the, he also calls antagonism. Antagonism in the sense that we cannot possibly allow unified whole of the social. The most well-known example of that is a class antagonism. So you can even say, I think, that Marx was a first multi-realist um, um, in, in the sense that he does not want to allow something like context. Uh, he does it because he wants to thoroughly deconstruct this idea of uh, representative power and representation. This depends on um, the ideology of democracy and more of our capitalism. So, um, like I said, um, this uh, Paul, um, if, if you're familiar with the Marxist discussion of the, of the rise of value form at the very beginning <coughs> of Capital of Volume 1, um, Paul here is uh, standing for um, the quote, and Peter Linn. Example, the pa those passages show that the nascent, um, the first step towards what is called the equivalence. Lenin's value is expressed by the coat. Here, the same uh, the, uh, relation is uh, captured by Peter and Paul. What is notable here is the, the, this uh, phrase, a physical form as Paul. How does Peter partakes <coughs> in the value of being humanity, a human being, is a question to you. Peter does it only to the extent that Peter's humanity looks like Paul's. Inequality because of the fact that Paul directly stands for humanity in his physical form. Because of which Peter's humanity has to look like Paul's physical shape. Analogously, when Lenin is <coughs> expressed in terms of the coat, the labor that goes into Lenin, which is weaving, has to disappear. Because labor as value now has to look like tailor that goes into making the coat. So, um, here, Marx is um, talking about the letter. Force of the is uh, inscribed into a commodity form. Letter in the sense that something is being concealed precisely by having something shown, physical shown. Abstraction is not, for Marx, abstraction is not something conceptual. Abstraction is materialized. It's a materiality of abstraction, that which is form. That form concealed, as we all, all, all know very well, for Marx that concealed. That's why he, he calls it fetishism, commodity fetishism. It conceals 
but it conceals the satisfy show. What it shows is something that flags its own self-condition. Why? Because of the fact that its rhetoric is by aggregation of all the labor that goes into it. The value of linen is all the labor that goes into it. Use value that is accumulated in the commodity of linen. However, the moment that its value is expressed in the physical shape of the coat, in the physical shape of tailoring as a labor of value, there's a gap. There's a gap. Rhetoric is, is a mere expression of something that already went in. All the use value that it was accumulating within linen is what is being expressed. But there's a gap. There's a gap in the sense that when linen's value is expressed in terms of the coat, when we, the labor value of the weaving is expressed in terms of the labor value of the tailoring, we have a, something like the effect of the letter, something concealed by showing. That something that is, been, is a showing, the thing is, um, has a rhetoric of self-condition sub-conditions of appearing, appearing, precisely because of the gap. Given the fact that there's a gap, or jump, shall we say, um, it's inadequate sign. The code is inadequate sign. But the effect of that is excessive effect. It's excessive effect. That's why he, he, he calls it fetishism. It's excessive precisely in the sense that it's a kind of appearing that self-conditions its own appearance. In that sense. Something inadequate is immediately becoming excessive, which is precisely the Lacanian idea of the letter. Which he uh, he you know he in his discussion of animals, non-human animals, he, he, he says that uh, that is a unique human human usage of sign. He says, for example, uh, animals, humans are the only species of animals which is uh, able to do pretense of pretense. Uh, uh, pretense of pretense. Um, so like a doubling up of uh, evasion. Animals can only pretend, but humans are the only ones who can pretend, pre do a double, double take of pretense, pretense, pretense. Which means, to, to translate into the, 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 the contemporary language, the theoretical language of a non-human, um, yeah, that people love, uh, it's a, we are talking about something that is beyond relationality. We are, we are talking about the relation between the subject and the world as more than the subject and object. The echo here is a, what I, what I what I mentioned briefly about Sartre, Bergson particularly Sartre because of that, the mutual exhaustibility of the world. So what is at stake here? Because of the fact that fetish, commodity fetish, is a, is a thing that is both inadequate and excessive. What, what is at stake here is a more than relation, but we are talking about relation of a relation. When you talk about relation of relation, we are talking about inner difference that is infolded and covered over by what Marx uh, calls an integument. It's covered over um, with something which hides. Mm. So this dimension of value form, um, this dimension of humanity, which is at stake in, the, in this passage about Peter and Paul, this humanity is not livable by any means. It is beyond the realm of experience. It only can take place in between this gap that I just talked about. The gap that Lacan captures by the, by the, the phrase, the, by the term, the latter, this gap. Um, it is an impossible transcendental object. 
it's impossible to transcend into a form which cannot be lived. It's a realm of Buddha. To that extent, um, capitalism always invokes a mystical realm, a realm of the beyond. To that extent, it's a magical act of power. To the extent that it is invoking dimension that is beyond the subject and object, beyond the relationality, beyond the relativity, uh, capitalism is acting exactly like religion. What's <coughs> interesting for me, and what is interesting for North Koreans who claim that they are the only legitimate successor of Marxism, is the fact that underlying Marxist discussion of uh, the value form, this material thing that is both material and abstract. What is underlying Marx's idea of uh, uh, Marx's discussion of all these things, as, as can be testified, as, as, it, as it is testified by the numerous footnotes around those passages, is pre-capitalist monarchical sovereign body. He constantly compares the rise of the form to monarchical body, sovereign body that mysteries of the royal substance, not in corpus mystically, as if we cannot understand what he talks about when he discusses commodity fetishes in normal form, as if we have to, as, as if he has to always go back to that pre-capitalist monarchical sovereign in order to talk about capitalism, as if he has to always talk about pre-modernity in order to talk about modernity. That's the key, I think. Paul, in the, in the passage that, we, that, that we, we are looking at here, Paul is the, is the inhabiting sovereign. Paul is the one who is directly standing for exchange ability. Paul is directly standing for value itself. It's a discussion of the monarchical sovereign body is exactly like that. So what I'm trying to suggest here is this. The reason that Marx is uh, tapping into pre-modernity to, to capture modernity, the reason he's talking about pre-capitalist monarchical sovereign power in order to capture capitalism's power is because he wants to show the rise of capitalism as something like a self-conditioned appearance. He wants to show that the appearance of a capitalism in history as, a, as an exertion of power, something that fascinates, that captures you. That's why it is not very easy to step outside of capitalism as if you do, do not belong, as if you are not captured by the thrall of capitalism. So I think it's, a, it's a very useful to think about why he has to resort to pre-modern examples to talk, to talk about modernity which is very perilous for me. Um, in other words, he wants to capture capitalism's emergence of history as something like a mobile instant of representation of before and after, the very act of designating before and after. In other words, something that you cannot possibly capture by presupposing the objective context for, as if from the third point of view, as if you can demarcate before and after as an objective fact. To, this is a little bit of side, but um, in any case, I mean, he, uh, because of this, um, you know, because of the you know, this inherent antagonism or impossibility, transcendental nature of capitalism, uh, he he also talks about the possibility of revolution, possibility of revolution arises out of that, possibility of revolution arises out of the material impossibility, which which is inscribed in the within capitalism. So counter tendency within the tendency of capitalism is what he's talking about. Um, um, uh, another word for, for that is that historicity, because capitalism carries itself towards its own transformation because of any, any possibility or because of the antagonism. 
or, or multi-realists will say because of perspectivism, irreducible perspectivism within capitalism, it will change. <coughs> um, Pluritaria, um, as a subject of a revolution, is none other than those who, who occupy that position, the fourth dimension of nobody, which capitalism has to invoke for its magical power. Floritaria is the is a subject who inserts themselves into that gap of impossibility. Floritaria is not empirical from the book. is only possible as nobody. That's Marx's way of uh, understanding capitalism as a assertion of power and also understanding revolution and, uh, by Floritaria as a is a similar kind of exertion of power. So I think in mature Marx, at least, he, uh, he doesn't have any moralistic um, um, description of a pluritaria as, a, as an inherent, like a morally superior kind of being. If anything, I think the pluritaria is talked about as, as, a, as a, a subject who only unleashes the magical power that capitalism is already exploiting. A gap that is inherent to capitalist exchange. Floritaria is a subject that automatically rises out of that. Um, okay. um, I'll, I'll, I have to uh, speed up a little bit. Um, um, uh, this will be a little fake. Um, uh, North Korean military is, is a bizarre, and, and so um, it, it, it uh, takes a lot of attention. Unfortunately, um, as I announced at the beginning, it's nearly uh, not my, my discussion of methodology. I'm stuck at the level where I'm reading North Korean political texts. I don't want to do it. It's boring as hell. <laughs> but anyone who wants to study North Korea has no choice but to do that, because that is like a founding idea of the nation. So once I began uh, doing that, I, I was like completely caught by it. Not because it was interesting, but it was just bizarre. And an opaque, so difficult to understand. And I was all, also captivated by the fact that no one takes them seriously. No one thinks it's a complicated idea. That's, I think, I, I, to me, I, but that is a very fascinating. And I'm going to talk about that today. Precisely the idea of life that I talk about. I want to talk about, <coughs> I'm very intrigued by how all the South Korean scholars who talk about life, all the Western scholars who talk about politi the political philosophy of North, North Korea, do anything to not to talk about this concept. They do, will do anything not to talk about life, as if it's, it's, if it's a, as if it is some kind of disease. Everyone is avoiding that. And so I think that's an interesting fact. I'm not too concerned at this point as to what what uh, what this uh, idea of life means to North Korean people. I, I'm, I'm not at that level yet. Uh, what I'm concerned about is why do, do people have to avoid this concept? You know, what is it about this concept that they are avoiding it as if it's a disease? So for that you have to read um, the South Korean uh, scholars' representations and the Western scholars' representations very carefully. So it's a textual, uh, meticulous te textual operation, which I cannot show, show you here, lack of time. But uh, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about why this concept is so complicated concept. It's a compli complicated concept because North Koreans approach their political philosophy as a power. That's why I, 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 I unpack Marx in that fashion. Because I, I, I want, I'm interested in how North Koreans read that sovereign power um, aspect of Marxism. And, and why they think that they are the only legitimate successor of Marxism. And why the leader is the embodiment of that. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, mm, so, as I just said, North Koreans um, um, take their political philosophy as a, not a mental gym, gymnastics, but a, something that is with a real power. Um, the, uh, 
um, they 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 do it while um, they are um, unleashing this um, uh, dimension of magic, shall we say, that we ju just talked about um, in, in, in the, regarding uh, Marx. They are talking about. When in, in their political philosophy, they are talking about something that is transcendental, that is not directly observable. Rather, as the Fabre Sadat says, it is a, it's a dimension that we can only approach indirectly, as if we are talking about some, something like amnesia, a vague perception that something in this cannot be coped with. Um, Something that I will find myself eventually. I have to deal with that time. Something that will disrupt my my narrative. Something that will create in myself as an unusual. But I'm not there yet. I guess. I'm, I mean, so now I'm interested in amnesia, shall we say, of our common things by North Korean political philosophy. What is it about the state <coughs> of life? They have to avoid like disease. Something there, I think, is going interesting. Is going on, and I will try to capture that in terms of amnesia. I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm just going to show you that. In other words, I'm talking about South Korean scholars and Western scholars, Western commentators on North Korea who presume that they are accepted from the throne of power in North Korea. Is congealed in the figure of the leader. Don't we? When we, when we see the you know, media representation of a North Korean leader, we immediately presume that that's laughable. I'm not part of it. My, my somewhat unrealistic ambition is to examine theories in such a way that we can re examine phenomena such as studies. Once we engage in rigorous critique of represent ideal representative power and how that organized our understanding of someone like Stalin, I think we can do something interesting. And the time is right for that because of uh, the vigorous critique of representation representationalism available through uh, school of thinking such as uh, multi-realism. In any case. Um, the uh, this life, um, this life. Um, let me just uh, jump a little bit. Um, this life um, is uh, has this structure. Um, oh, I didn't show you this slide. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah it's just another way. Okay, here. So. At, at, the, at the foundation, very foundation of the North Korean political philosophy is this thing called Juche. Juche is a, a self-reliance. A, a focal point of Juche, a culmination of Juche is the leader, the leader, Suryong. Focal point of that is life. Let me explain what self-reliance or Juche means. Self-reliance, the philosophy of self-reliance um, was, uh, was forwarded by the founding father of the nation, Kim Il-sung, in the response to the fracturing internationalism of uh, uh, communist state, states, particularly the dispute between China and, and Soviet Union was a historic context in which the state came out. Political philosophy of the self-reliance or Che emphasizes creativity, Changdo-san. Creativity, uh, they, they forward the side of creativity and say that this is the only legitimate way, the only appropriate way to succeed Marxist Leninism. I'm not, I'm not making a, 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 a distinction between Marxism and Leninism in this book. This idea of succession, Kesen, is an interesting concept because it, it's a genealogical concept. So it is a it is a simultaneously a, a succession of the leader, succession of the regime, as well as succession of Marxist Leninism itself. Here, their argument becomes really interesting. They say, 
Soviet unions in Eastern, Eastern, Eastern European nations and China's succession of the Marxist Leninism was illegitimate. It was illegitimate succession. The reason was because, the reason is because they overemphasized object world, or kekwansik, object world. Marxist, well known Marxism's economism is part of that bias. They call it unscientific, unscientific, which is bizarre. Their overemphasis on object world is unscientific. There are two other items that they mention all the time about illegitimate succession. Another one is superstition, I'm not going to explain that. Another one is a personal personality cult. Personality cult. They, they emphasize very much of the fact that their idea of a leader has nothing to do with the personality cult. The Stalinist also says something similar, but I, I think North Korean's argument is much more interesting. And Juche is the only way you can be scientific in Korean Hapapjik Jok, Hapapjik Song. Or lawfulness, they say, Juche philosophy is the only way to, to succeed Marxist Leninism in a lawful way. Lawfulness, which is like a really interesting term. What is this then? This thing called Juche, or self reliance. That means merely a human capacity of self creation, self conditioning, self relating, a human ability to envelop oneself contain difference within oneself, shall we say. Which includes the act of relating to the object world. I mean, if I put it that way, that's, a, that's, a, that's a precisely Engels' idea of dialectical materialism. The human agency is already part of the object world, right? Um, and they say, this is very interesting. So, this idea of Juche comes before all the histories of philosophy, histories of philosophy between materialism versus rationalism, is it in the mind or in the material? We still engage in that, right? They say, Kim Il-sung, in founding this idea of Juche, stop. Not only stop, stop in the sense of culmination of philosophy, but he found the origin of this. He found the origin. So the moment that is before all that, it's the very street philosophy as a rationalism versus materialism. Juche, they say, is a, has a found a true origin of philosophy itself, political politics, as well as humanity. It's the origin point of a, a history. What is the origin point of history, and why do they call this philosophy their idea scientific? It is because the origin point of humanity, origin point of philosophy and history and everything, the origin point is self-origination. It's self-departure. At the origin was repetition, is what they're saying. That's why this idea of Juche is also, at the same time, beginning and at the end. So, this origin cannot be located in calend calendrical time, history as, you, as we know it, or proleptic history. That is why when you read the North Korean text, it sounds ridiculous. Because Kim Il-sung, as a founder of this self-originated point of the human, human humanity itself, uh, of course comes after um, the uh, uh, Marx, who is called on a, as another leader, uh, or something like anti-Japanese resistance movement. All these things came, uh, Kim Il-sung came after, but they talk about it in terms of how all these things are not merely historical precedents, but examples of this foundation. You see. So all these things that happened before Kim Il-sung came about is all thanks to Kim Il-sung. Time before Kim Il-sung, as well as time after Kim Il-sung, all are, are indebted to Kim Il-sung's emergence. Or the, the founding of the Juche philosophy. His discovery of this philosophy. They keep emphasizing the fact that this is not a fabrication, but this is a discovery of the truth. True origin of the humanity. So, they have a very interesting idea of succession. Then, 
succession is a repetition, is retrospectively legitimizes what came before. Right? It's a magical operation, in the sense that one of the interesting aspects about magic, according to Marcel Marx, is that magic is at the same time talked about as if it is happening in, a, in its milieu, magical milieu. But people turn around and talk about magical practice as if it is a very operational creative the milieu. <coughs> it's a container and a container. <coughs> it's immanence and transcendence at the same time, precisely what Kant tried to capture by the term transcendental, which is who's a, who's a, um, the origin of the of course, Christian theology. Christian theology uh, made a transition from theology to, to ontos theology because of the, of the, the advent of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, God used to be a uh, uh, transcendent subject in relation to which he could represent the world. When Christ comes along in the human body, he complicates that. That's ontos theology. And, 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 and all Kant did was to theorize that, that what happened in between then, in between immanence and transcendence, we are transcendent. So still I'm talking about that. In the example of that, I, I talked about through uh, Marx. And in Bergson's other times, is it like that. So, um, so anyway, um, let me uh, just uh, try to wrap up very quickly. So, um, so uh, this life is a self-centralization of that truth, self-relating, self-conditioning. That principle itself is congealed into substance. Why do they call it life? The reason is because biological life, of course, is the thing that self-conditions, right? that self-relates. That's biological life. Um, so, if you understand history in, the, in that terms, what, what happens then is you, you're collapsing life with a task to appropriate that life. That's lawfulness. In other words, you are unlocking the potential that is already in you. In Greek, Greek uh, myth, there is, a, there is a destiny, the idea of destiny, something that is lodged within yourself. You <coughs> Through events, you discover that thing that is within you, that is infolded within you as inner difference. Right? That's Greek, uh, the idea of the destiny. It, it's exactly like that here. That's why life that you already have has to be also task. The collapsing of the two concepts is lawfulness. It's pretty, very precise and, and systematic philosophy, I think. That's what they mean by lawfulness. That's what they mean by scientific. You are scientific only when you are in, engaged in the task of unlocking the inner potential that you already have, or history you already had. That's the only kind of science that they approve of. So the leader uh, is, a, is a kind of focal point of that. Mm, and and uh, through, through uh, the inculcation of this political philosophy, one citizen gets to partake that substance. Um, similarly as when linen is compared, ha having its, its value expressed through the coat, linen gets to partake in the value that the, the coat is directly representing. But I, I'm not going, going to go, go there um, now. Um, but anyway, so uh, go back to uh, the idea of uh, the discussion of ontological theology. This may interest you. Um, because of, uh, because of the fact that you know, this ontological theology that I just talked about is very, very important to the founding fathers of Western political theory, such as Hobbes and Machiavelli and all these people. Um, because I just talked about ontological theology, how Christ, the appear, appearance of Christ, um, created this dimension that was not thought about before, dimension between transcendence and humans. Um, Machiavelli and, and Hobbes and all these people talked about their idea of uh, uh, political power. Power um, is entirely uh, uh, the, uh, coming out of this uh, ontotheology because of this reason. 
this is a question. I think you will be interested in this because I think most of us are interested in how exactly political power works. What is the most fundamental question of political power? And according to Machiavelli, Hobbes, um, and and on the theology, uh, uh, on the theology. But the most fundamental the, the, the um, question of a political power is this. How, okay, you have a force. Force is a nothing but just a brutal force to subjugate someone, to make, make someone to do something or appropriate something for yourself. If that's force, how do you create, how do you generate that particularity? How do you generate universality out of that particularity is a question. How do you, given the fact that, okay, you have force, how do you subjugate a population you know, without using that force all the time? How do you do that? Okay, you, you have a particularity of the power. Maybe that is signaled by your presence, the particular historical body. How do you make that work perpetually? There is a question of how do you transform force into just force? How do you create justice out of force. How do you create the law out of force is a question. You know, I think it's, it's quite important that we remember this whenever we talk about power. I'm quoting here Louis Morin. Louis Morin's um, um, book called The Portrait of the King is about the Louis XIV and how Louis XIV wanted to generate the effect of absolute power. You know, given the fact that Louis XIV is the one person, particular person, historically situated, how do you make your power ubiquitous everywhere? How is it that you are a individual person who can be in one particular place at a time? How do you create the effect where your, your subjects have this expectation that Louis XIV is everywhere? How do you negotiate that particular universality? Which is an analogous to the problem. How do you, given the fact that you, you have a brute force, how do you create justice or law out of that? Um, anyway, to, 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 the, 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 the answer, Marang's uh, answer is inadequate sign. Inadequate sign in, in, in signaling the inadequacy somehow mysteriously points to the beyond. Absolutely. And the way he unpacks that is precisely this gap that I talked about. Gap that is inherent to the letter. Sig between signify and the signified shall we say. The gap. That structuralist uh, talked about forever, right? The gap. The gap that is inadequate and precise because of the reason excessive. The gap that is signaling the fact that something is hidden precisely because something is shown, right? Anyway, so what is interesting about uh, the uh, North Korean idea of saying the life and why they think that it's a lawfulness embodied it, it is the fact that if Louis XIV needed representations like portrait, his face on the on coins and all that, in order to effect that absoluteness. What is crazy about North Korean philosophy and what is crazy about North Korean idea of life is the fact that they don't even need absolute. Everything is in the body of the sovereign. Everything in the body of Kim il -sung. Immediately. He's an embodiment of a science, you see. That's what they need. When they, when they say, when they say, uh, when they see this, uh, this uh, infinite wisdom losing out of him, that's what they need. He's a scientific, he's a lawfulness embodied. History and everything is, is rolled into this God. Right? There, if I, 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 I use Marang's um, idea, um, force and the law are coincide. coincide. They're one. You don't even need representation of anything. They're one. Right? Anyway, then why South Korean scholars and Western scholars have to avoid that life as if it's a disease? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, to be continued. Thank you.
Thank you.